Good morning, everyone. I'm Associate Professor Jacqueline Yeo, the Director of the Center for Asian Legal Studies. Welcome to the inaugural event of our new online series, The Virtual Roundtables on Asian Law. This series is our way of bringing to you quality content from legal experts on Asia into your domains, wherever you are. It is our response to the current disruptions, which we want to turn around as an opportunity to adapt, to make our programs even more accessible, engaging, and flexible for a wider audience. Now, the first set of roundtables will center on legal issues arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. But this series is more than that. We will showcase the vitality and diversity of Asian legal experience, Asian legal practice, and Asian legal perspectives. We want to put Asia at the forefront of intellectual legal debates. And so today I am proud and grateful that we have been able to bring together our esteemed speakers to discuss the highly pertinent question of the impact of COVID-19 on executive power and constitutionalism in Asia. It is the first step in what we hope to be a journey of a thousand miles granted virtually. So thank you for joining us. And without further ado, I will hand over the time to Professor Kevin Tan, who will be hosting today's roundtable and introducing our speakers. On to you, Kevin. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, good morning, everybody. At least it's morning here in Singapore. Uh, my name is Kevin Tan and I teach uh, at the Faculty of Law, National University of Singapore. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first of this uh, virtual roundtables on Asian law series and also to introduce to you our speakers for this morning. Um, we first have um, Professor Aparna Chandra. She is the assistant, uh, assistant professor at the National Law School of India in Delhi uh, and research director of the Center for Constitutional Law, Policy and Governance. Her research is in constitutional law, human rights, legal theory, gender and the law and judicial process reform. Uh, she will be our first speaker. Second speaker is uh, Professor Melissa Crouch. She's Associate Professor and Associate Dean of Research at the uh, Faculty of Law, University of New South Wales. Uh, she is an established scholar on Southeast Asian studies and has written books on uh, constitutional developments in Indonesia as well as in Myanmar. Uh, our third speaker is uh, Professor Ye Jinrong, uh, Distinguished Professor and Chair Professor at the College of Law National Taiwan University and in addition to being one of the region's preeminent scholars in constitutional law, administrative law and environmental law, uh, he has the distinction of having served twice uh, in the cabinet of uh, Taiwan and held four different portfolios uh, including the Minister for Education uh, and the Minister for the Interior and I think uh, we will benefit greatly from him sharing especially uh, talking about executive power in a time of crisis, how this might work and look like from two perspectives. The way we will proceed is this. Uh, we will have each speaker speak for 10 to 15 minutes without pause, meaning from one speaker to the next speaker, uh, after which we will take questions at the end. Uh, but in the meantime, I would urge all of you who are listening in uh, to please use the chat function of the Zoom webinar uh, to type your questions in. We will be collating your questions as they come along. So you don't have to wait till the very end to put in your questions. Uh, type them as we go along. And if you want to direct these questions specifically to any one of uh, the speakers here, please indicate that as much. Uh, I will do my best at the end uh, of the session to try and sort of uh, collate and curate the various questions together and uh, hopefully get the responses that you desire. So with that, uh, let me please now turn the floor and invite uh, Professor Aparna Chandra uh, to be our first speaker. Aparna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, thank you, Center for Asian Legal Studies, for putting together this panel, for inviting me on it, and for giving me the opportunity to engage with all of you on this very, very important topic. Um, 
Right. So um, I, let me jump straight into my uh, presentation. Since we're talking about executive power in the time of crisis, uh, let me begin by talking about the crisis itself. In India, at least, this is not one, but three crises. There's a health crisis, which is the pandemic itself. There's a humanitarian crisis, which has been brought about by the state's response to the pandemic. The, specifically, a very stringent lockdown announced with only four hours notice, which has upended people's lives and livelihoods, thrown them into a situation of scarcity. Um, and among the many tragedies unfolding as a result is a huge wave of migration back from urban settings to villages. That's uh, people um, uh, who are walking back from urban settings to villages, sometimes walking hundreds to thousands of kilometers on foot to get back to their uh, villages because they are um, in very precarious situations um, in, in these urban sitting, uh, settings where they've come for work. So that's another crisis that the state is now responding to. And then there is an economic crisis that predates the pandemic but has worsened because of it. And I'm going to be looking at the executive's response to all three of these crises, uh, the response of other branches of government to the executive, and the concerns that both of these sets of responses raise for constitutionalism in India. Before I begin, though, a 30-second primer on, Indian, on the Indian constitution, just to set the context. So India has a Westminster style of um, parliamentary form of government, where the executive is responsible uh, to the legislature, at least on paper. Uh, it is also a constitutional democracy, so it has a written uh, constitution with a bill of rights, a judiciary that's empowered to review executive and legislative actions for compliance with the constitution and to strike down any law that um, or, or any executive action that does not comply with the constitution. Um, India follows a common law system and common law principles of administrative law by and large apply like they do to other common law uh, countries. It is also a federal uh, system, so power is broadly divided between the federal government, which is the central or the union government, the states, and a range of local bodies. So when we talk about the executive in India, we're talking about um, executives at different levels of government. Now, how has the a gov the, the executive responded to this crisis. The executive has responded to this crisis by deploying delegated powers under existing laws, by using the power of ordinances, and I'll come to what that means, and by using the power of the cr cr criminal uh, sanction. What I'm going to do today is take you through these three mechanisms to explain how uh, the executive has deployed these powers. And I will argue that this has led to an expansion of executive power with very little accountability to the legislature. And the judiciary, which does have the power to hold the executive to uh, account, has been extending undue deference to the executive and has therefore limited the potential of accountability of the judicial mechanism as well. Okay, so first let me look at delegated powers under existing laws. So the executives has responded to the COVID crisis by um, using powers under two laws, the disaster management, um, well, under one law at the central level, that's the Disaster Management Act, which as you can see, gives very, very broad and sweeping powers to a national authority, which is chaired by the, the prime minister of the uh, country, um, and a national executive committee, which is an adjunct body of bureaucrats that implements the uh, decisions taken by the national authority. And they have really a carte blanche to do whatever they, they deem necessary uh, to meet the exigencies of the situation. So what are the kind of things that they've done? They've imposed one of the most stringent lockdowns anywhere in the uh, world. This is an Oxford um, response uh, tracker, government response tracker. And if you look at uh, right at the top, uh, 100 is the highest score you can get in terms of stringency. And India for the longest time had the most stringent uh, uh, the lockdown. They've gradually stepped uh, stepped it down, um, but it's still a very, very stringent um, uh, lockdown in India. And uh, that, of course, has huge implications for the freedom of movement, for the freedom to work, uh, implications for livelihood, etc., etc., etc. And um, all of that is done under this broad delegated power to do anything that the government wants to do, the executive wants to do. Um, uh, Using, uh, using the powers under the Disaster Management Act. Just to see how India today compares to the rest of Asia, 
it's doing marginally better uh, right now um, compared to the rest of Asia. Just about 10 days ago, uh, it was at the darker end, at, at, a, at a much more darker end of, of the scale. Um, okay, um, again, the kind of rights violations we are looking at right now, for example, there is um, uh, a night curfew from 7 p.m. at night to 7 a.m. Uh, every morning. This implies that no one can move out of the house except for essential uh, uh, services. And there is no justification whatsoever provided for the uh, by the government for why there is a night uh, curfew. Uh, it's not as if the virus spreads uh, faster at, uh, at night, but there has been no justification whatsoever, just this fear, which says that this, is, this has to be done using the powers under the Disaster Management Act. Okay, then at the state level, we have a colonial era legislation called the Epidemic Diseases Act, which again gives the state pretty much a similar carte blanche to, to take any uh, decision that is deemed necessary to prevent uh, the outbreak of an epidemic or to, uh, uh, or to prevent the uh, spread thereof. Again, state governments have used the Epidemic Diseases Act to pass sweeping uh, regulations and take sweeping uh, actions that have a range of consequences for uh, um, uh, for rights, um, vested, vested rights and fundamental rights uh, of individuals. To give again one example, um, the Delhi regulations uh, say that all employers of private uh, establishments, whether they be multi-million dollar corporations or you know your local mom and pop shop, um, are required to treat even during the lockdown, treat all employees who can't come to uh, work to be on duty and have to be paid in full. Now. This might be good in principle, but there's a lot of range of practical difficulties without this government having provided any kind of wage subsidy or any kind of stimulus to, um, uh, to individuals, wage stimulus to uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, establishments to actually uh, pass on that benefit to, uh, to employees. And so this has, a, uh, this has huge consequences for how people uh, lead their lives, but again, uh, passed with, without any uh, legislative oversight. This is just the executive acting on its uh, own. And finally, at the district level, uh, the Code of Criminal Procedure gives power to the district administration to again pass virtually any kind of um, you know, rule regulation um, in order to uh, ensure that there's no obstruction, annoyance, injury, or danger to human life, health, safety, etc. Very, very broadly uh, broadly uh, worded. In fact, the night curfew is implemented at the district level using uh, this uh, power. Now, so what is happening uh, as a result is rights are being deeply infringed, maybe justifiably, maybe not, but they're being deeply infringed without any oversight from the legislature using pre-existing laws, very, very widely worded laws. Now, this is not uh, being done only with respect to uh, COVID and just the response to the uh, pandemic. But similar, um, you know, use of widely worded uh, rules, regulations, notification powers are being used by governments um, at the center and at the state level to uh, dilute the impact of labor laws in order to uh, deal with the economic crisis. So, for example, um, the states that have diluted the, uh, the, uh, the have uh, removed the eight hour work week, uh, eight hour work day requirement and extended that up to 12 hours uh, in many states in the country using uh, an exemption power, uh, you know, under the Factories Act or have exempted classes and or all institutions from the, uh, from, uh, the application of the Factories Act or the Industrial Disputes Act, some of the linchpins of, you know, labor uh, rights in, uh, in the country. And they've done that using broad delegated powers under those, uh, those laws. Uh, second is the ordinance power. Now, what is the ordinance power? The Constitution of India provides that um, the executive has this device in its hand, which has the force and effect of an act of parliament, but it's temporary in nature. And the executive can use that, uh, that power to, to enact a, a legislation-like uh, thing uh, when either House of Parliament is not in uh, session or when either House of the Legislature is not in uh, session, if there's an urgent uh, need. But this is only temporary and it lapses within six weeks of Parliament uh, uh, resuming work. 
but what uh, the uh, but one implication of this is that any action that is done under the ordinance um, will which has already been done under the ordinance uh, remains to be enforced even after the ordinance lapses so what the uh, what many state governments have been doing is they've been enacting labor law reform uh, which is code for you know removing labor law uh, protections um, in many parts of the country uh, using the ordinance route because uh, fa parliament or the state legislatures um, are all uh, prorogued at the, at the moment. Um, so that's another way in which the executive is exercising very, very wide powers without any uh, legislative oversight. And finally, the criminal sanction. Now, why, is, why am I talking about the criminal sanction um, here? I'm talking about the criminal sanction because uh, criminal sanction gives power in the hands of the foot soldiers of the executive, that is the police. And uh, the way in which uh, the criminal sanction has been used has been to give enormous and unchecked power into the that branch of the executive that most people come in contact with on a daily basis. That's your local beat constable. So for example, uh, if uh, any of the orders passed under the Sweeping Disaster Management Act or the Epidemic Diseases Act are violated, then there's criminal sanction uh, that is, uh, 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 that, uh, that, that's provided for. And so uh, you have orders that have been passed, for example, to say that you cannot print anything about the government's actions with respect to COVID without first checking with the government. This is in a country which has freedom of speech and expression in its constitution. And if you violate this, then there is a criminal uh, uh, penalty, all passed under rules and uh, regulations. And the other way in which all of this is enforced is section 188 of the Indian Penal Code, which I'm guessing has analogs in many of the countries that we will be uh, talking about today, which says that uh, if you disobey the order of a duly, uh, order duly promulgated by a public servant, then uh, there are going to be a, a range of uh, criminal uh, sanctions. This is the power that is being used to enforce uh, the lockdown and enforce the range of uh, executive fiats that have been issued. Uh, now, where would, what happens to, I'm going to take two more minutes and uh, wrap up. Um, what what happens so so if if this is how the executive has been acting what about the accountability mechanisms now there are two institutional accountability mechanisms in the indian constitution the legislature and the judiciary the legislature of course acts as a forum for deliberation and justification whether the executive has to come and justify its decisions and maybe uh, you know uh, give way to a better argument that is not happening because the legislatures are not sitting uh, it's a forum for accountability but it's a weak forum for accountability currently uh, india has a single party majority um, other countries um, have, which follow the Westminster model have tried to put in uh, systems to shore up the accountability, um, uh, you know, the accountability prowess of the legislature by putting in, for example, strong committee procedures. India has very weak committee procedures with very limited oversight of the uh, executive. And while the uh, legislature in the, in the current scenario has no power of uh, directly overseeing the, uh, the, exec the executive's deployment of you know, executive power under any of the acts that I mentioned, typically it has um, oversight of uh, ex post facto oversight of delegated powers, but that's something that the executive, uh, that the legislature very rarely uses. So in the last parliament, they didn't look at rules and regulations under laws uh, that were tabled in parliament. They didn't, uh, they didn't discuss even a single one of them in the entire duration of that parliament. Um, the other, of course, um, check that uh, the legislature exercises on, exec on the executive is the principles of delegation, right? They, uh, you know, the, the principles of administrative law that uh, protect against excessive delegation and that require guided powers. Uh, that 
and that require that for the violation of fundamental rights, there has to be a legal basis. But again, uh, in the current context, the way in which the uh, legislature has, uh, the, the executive has been deploying, you know, a, a fig leaf of a, a legal basis uh, with very little uh, guidance from the legislature on how it should be exercising its powers and very f little uh, by way of limitation on those powers in the acts that I mentioned, um, means that this, this kind of limitation is also not being exercised. Let me just go on. And just to say, finally, that uh, the judiciary is the other forum that is available uh, for accountability uh, of the executive's action. Let me now turn the uh, floor or rather the screen over to Melissa, please. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to be involved and congratulations to the Centre for Asian Legal Studies. Um, Kevin and Jacqueline, I think it's wonderful that you're taking the lead on this and it's really the obvious place of expertise um, to take the lead. So I'm going to focus on Southeast Asia, um, but I do think there's certainly um, similarities and resonances with other parts of Asia. And what I want to do, I guess, first of all, is to think about pre-COVID-19 and then um, consider post-COVID-19 in Southeast Asia. So pre-COVID-19, I think it's fair to say that in the past few years, there's been a lot of discussion and debate about what some have called the illiberal turn in Southeast Asia. And so I think in many respects, even before COVID-19, we have seen uh, an increasing use of executive power in ways that potentially infringe on people's rights um, or that compromise uh, the constitutional democracy that had previously existed in some countries and, and Indonesia being one of the obvious examples. So I think when we're talking about a COVID-19 Southeast Asia, um, my argument would be that while COVID-19 is not the cause of this illiberal turn, that it is exacerbating or perhaps consolidating that illiberal turn. So let me explain what I mean um, with reference to four key um, trends that I see taking place. And these are broadly speaking restrictions on civil and political rights, um, an expansion of the role of the military and other armed forces, um, a role of the courts in enforcing executive decisions uh, and um, challenges around attempts to try and continue constitution making or amendment processes during this major health crisis. So let me start on the first one, on restrictions on uh, civil and political rights. Obviously, this is not um, unique to Southeast Asia, um, but we see across the region that a combination of presidential decrees, uh, legislative measures, um, as well as states of emergency being used um, across the region. So, for example, uh, in Indonesia, we have a presidential decree. Um, and yet what we also see, I guess, is a lot of confusion. So um, unlike India, uh, Indonesia was, the president came out and said, we're not going to do what India has done. We don't want to enforce a lockdown because we think it will have a significant negative effect on the socioeconomic conditions of those who are um, most vulnerable. Um, and yet there was tension with particularly the governor of Jakarta, Anies Baswedan, who wanted to enforce more of a stricter lockdown. And so for the first um, few weeks, and perhaps even now, there has been significant confusion in Indonesia about the extent and scope of the lockdown um, and what laws people should actually be complying with. Um, similarly, in um, Myanmar, actually, like India, has also used uh, Section 144 uh, provision of the um, uh, Penal Code. And uh, that has largely been to impose a curfew. Um, in fact, when you look at it closely, though, it's relatively mild. So actually, the curfew in most places is only from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m., which is really when most people are sleeping, um, and has been in some areas, but not all areas of Myanmar. Uh, another... so. One restriction then being on freedom of movement. Um, there are a range of other more concerning restrictions, I'd suggest, though. So one is on freedom of speech. And what we're seeing, I think, is um, COVID-19 being used as an excuse to crack down on civil society. So, for example, um, whether it's critics of the government um, in Indonesia and, and people who are criticising the government's response to COVID-19 being um, targets of the law. Um, or in Myanmar, where in Rakhine State, where um, fighting is still taking place, um, the government is targeting journalists 
who are reporting on a group um, known as the Arakan Army, which is fighting against the military. Um, but the, the government is targeting journalists who are trying to cover this, this conflict, um, but is doing so claiming that um, it's necessary at this time. Um, there's also an issue with uh, an internet blackout in Rakhine State, which um, makes communication incredibly difficult. Um, and in Indonesia, we see the postponement of elections. So there were supposed to be regional elections in September. They've been postponed to December, as many other countries around the world have had to do for obvious reasons. So those are some of the issues around um, restrictions on civil and political rights, and I could have gone much further. But let me now move on to, I guess, consider the connection then to the expansion of military power or the role of the police in particular. Um, and I should caveat this by saying that even in Australia, um, we have seen this too. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, when I was um, going for a walk in the park every morning, which we were still allowed to do under lockdown, um, there were police on horse um, in the park that I was um, uh, walking around, just sort of checking and, and monitoring things. So even here, we have sort of felt that increased um, police or military presence. Um, now in Myanmar, there has been a significant development where the military has in fact decided to form its own COVID-19 response committee. Um, and this is separate from the government, the NLD's sort of parallel in some sense, response COVID-19 um, unit. And I think this um, is a unusual development, but certainly indicates one where the military is wanting to lead. Um, and certainly in the, the months um, that are leading up to another election in Myanmar, it is perhaps an attempt by the military to assert its um, legitimacy and its authority at this time and try to gain public support. Um, also in Indonesia, although it's not um, the military in overt sense, actually many of the civilian positions that relate to health, so some in the Ministry of Health and others who are on the COVID-19 sort of response unit, are in fact former military officers. Um, and so some people have raised concerns about this. Um, there are, in the region, there are other examples, like we talk about the Philippines and in Duterte, um, he has given the military and the police power to shoot on sight, I believe, those who are not complying with um, lockdown orders. Um, and so I think this is a worrying trend acro across the region. So the next, the, my third consideration then comes to the courts. What are the courts doing? Um, to what extent are they enforcing executive um, decrees and rules? Or to what extent are they acting as a check on the power of the executive? Um, on one hand, in countries like Myanmar, we are seeing some worrying trends where the courts are um, enforcing various executive decrees somewhat unevenly and in ways that exacerbate social um, uh, tensions and discrimination in particular. So in Myanmar, there have been situations where um, a Christian pastor was accused of breaching lockdown. Um, likewise, some Muslims were accused of uh, breaching lockdown, as well as some Buddhists. Um, and yet what has happened is both the Christian pastor and the Muslims were jailed, and yet the Buddhists who broke curfew were simply given a fine. And so there were concerns among minority groups in Myanmar that perhaps um, the executive orders were being applied unfairly to certain minority groups. Um, now, in Indonesia, um, there is some uh, measure of, of checks on executive power. Um, and at the moment, there is a case in the Constitutional Court that is challenging the president's decree regarding the economic stimulus package. So basically during the COVID-19 crisis, um, the president in Indonesia has passed a decree which um, is supposed to facilitate greater uh, economic stimulus, but also um, grants immunity to government officials who are involved in, um, in that process. So basically what it has done is raised concerns among civil society um, that it could lead to corruption. Um, in the uh, distribution of these funds. That case is still ongoing in the Constitutional Court at the moment, but is certainly one to watch in terms of possible checks on executive power um, in Indonesia. Finally, I just want to come to um, this question of, well, sh should um, governments around the world be allowed to um, continue with constitution making or constitutional amendment processes at the moment? And in particular, what are the challenges for peace processes? Um, and I think this is important to talk about because um, in the middle of COVID-19, the UN Secretary General um, did come out and uh, strongly call for a ceasefire um, in areas of conflict around the world um, uh, 
acknowledging um, the common threat that COVID-19 faces um, and the need for governments to be focused on that particular threat and not um, other forms of conflict. So there have certainly been calls in Myanmar for um, a ceasefire following on from the UN Secretary General's call. Um, we did see earlier this month in May, the military did um, declare something of a limited ceasefire. So it said, yes, we'll, we'll agree to a ceasefire. However, we won't agree to a ceasefire in areas where there are um, identified terrorist organizations, namely in Rakhine State and Shin State. So um, unfortunately, the areas where there is the most conflict at the moment, perhaps, the military has not agreed to a ceasefire. Um, I think this is also relevant for other um, countries, perhaps uh, Southern Thailand and Southern Philippines, um, and also more broadly connects to constitution making processes. So, of course, Myanmar was um, in the middle of debating a constitutional amendment um, bill in March, just as, um, you know, there were very clear signs that COVID-19 could have a major impact in Myanmar. Um, and yet it went ahead with that sort of as normal. Now it has decided to um, suspend or postpone the referendum that needs to take place on some minor um, issues. Um, but certainly it did continue with that constitution making process. And in some sense, there are parallels perhaps with Russia, although I believe they did also um, decide to postpone their constitution making process that they, that they are going through. And then more recently, the Philippines um, with its constitutional amendment process that has also been um, now halted as of the 21st of May. So um, just to conclude, um, I've tried to suggest today that actually we've seen a significant expansion of executive power um, in Southeast Asia pre-COVID-19, um, but yet uh, it's inevitable, I think, that the COVID-19 situation is um, exacerbating or strengthening that. Um, and they're particularly worrying concerns, as I've mentioned, about the role of the military in some countries across the region. So thanks. Thanks very much, Melissa. So uh, now it's my turn to speak and I will talk a little bit about Singapore. And I want to take off uh, from uh, uh, what Apana was talking about just now. Singapore, just like India, has also got a Westminster style constitution. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, a lot of the uh, legislation that uh, we have, uh, in fact, much of which was originally copied from India in, 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 in the old days. But in any case, um, let, let me just begin by talking a little bit about the situation in Singapore. Now, Singapore identified its first COVID-19 case in um, January, the 23rd of January 2020. And immediately, the government set up a joint ministerial committee, which was chaired by the health minister and comprises a number of other ministers from the other ministries. And... Um, Within less than two weeks, uh, they declared Doscon Orange, which is basically the second highest level of alert uh, as far as Singapore was concerned. But there was no, no immediate lockdown. And uh, it was only on the 3rd of April where uh, the so-called circuit breaker, a euphemism for a lockdown, uh, was actually implemented in Singapore, uh, where we, it was originally meant to last to the 4th of May, but has been extended uh, to the 2nd of June. So we are kind of looking forward to when things start opening up next week. Um, now, while the pandemic spread all over uh, Asia uh, and a number of countries, including uh, Japan and Thailand, uh, have actually declared states of emergency. So one of the things which um, I suppose uh, uh, a constitutional lawyer looking at this would be, uh, would it have been uh, something appropriate. In fact, we were speculating whether or not uh, Article 150 of the Constitution, which allows the government to declare an emerge, a state of emergency, might actually be uh, be, be, be utilised. Um, interestingly, the government chose not to do so. Uh, instead, um, because uh, the legislation uh, uh, contains a lot of very wide discretionary powers given to the state, as well as very wide powers to make law for the state uh, uh, on the basis of subsidiary legislation, they chose to do that instead. Uh, now, so suddenly uh, we had the power to, to declare emergency because Article 150 talks about uh, where the uh, security and economic life of Singapore is threatened. They did not do this. Instead, what they did was to invoke the legislative power uh, and this was made easy by the fact, like I said, that uh, the constitution 
uh, gives to the legislature a very wide legislative berth uh, to deviate from rights that are guaranteed under constitution. So for example, if you look at Article 13.2 of the constitution, which talks about banishment and about freedom of movement, Article 13.2 actually says that subject to any law relating to security of Singapore, um, public order, public health, right, or punishment of offenders, every citizen uh, has the right to move freely throughout Singapore and to reside in any part thereof. So yes, you have a right to move freely, except where public health concerns. So there's no need really to invoke uh, uh, the, the constitution, uh, so to speak. So to effect this, what they did was to pass the uh, control movement, uh, the COVID Temporary Measures Act, uh, on 7th of April. Now, this is quite different from what happened in India. Um, this was an act that was targeted specifically at dealing with the COVID-19 situation. So, although the primary act itself, which was passed by parliament very quickly, uh, does not contain any sunset clause, doesn't have a, a run-by date, a, a use-up date, uh, it does provide for a series of things uh, which includes, among other things, um, temporary relief uh, from suits of failure to perform scheduled contracts, modified the Bankruptcy Act to assist firms that may be in financial distress. Uh, it provided alternative means for holding meetings, especially company meetings, annual general meetings, as well as societal meetings that need to meet the regulations. And of course, the one that we all are are faced with all the time, which is the temporary measures to control movement. Now, what they then did was that uh, in furtherance of this control movement agenda, they promulgated a set of regulations. These are subsidiary legislation. So they promulgated these uh, control orders. And what is interesting is that these control orders actually run only for the duration of the so-called circuit breaker period. In other words, there is a sunset clause. Um, uh, so for me, it was a rather uh, uh, satisfying thing in a sense that although uh, these measures were rather draconian in the way that it curtailed uh, uh, our movements and so on, uh, uh, it was not intended to be uh, capitalized upon uh, to, to perpetuate continuous control. In other words, it was intended uh, only for that specific period. So there will be a sunset clause. So come uh, the midnight of the 1st of June, uh, these uh, 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 control regulations would basically evaporate, right? Um, now, um, there have, of course, been some issues uh, that have been promulgated under other existing facilitating legislation. So, for example, under the Immigration Act, which, of course, gives the state tremendous powers to control people moving in and out of Singapore, a number of regulations have been uh, implemented whereby uh, you're stopping uh, work pass holders from uh, now Singapore has a very big transient working population. Uh, large numbers of people travel daily from Malaysia into Singapore to work and this was a big major problem because once you wanted to close the borders and ensure that people don't move up and down just in case they may be carrying uh, the virus along with them, uh, you begin to see many, many problems, right? Uh, one of which, of course, is a loss of livelihood and so on. Um, and um, so in furtherance of this Immigration Act, foreign domestic workers were not allowed back into Singapore without permission from the Ministry of Manpower. Same thing with the work pass holders who, who travel back and forth. Uh, foreign students uh, who were not already in Singapore, if they had gone back for holidays, would have again to apply to the Ministry of Education to explain why they need to come back to Singapore. After all, they had suspended classes for two months. So uh, there was really no need for you to come back. So th there are all these regulations that have been put in place, which, is, which are basically governed by administrative fiat, which is basically an executive power, right? Uh, so there was no need for any additional legislative intervention. And uh, I think the basic point of this, and I want to uh, uh, echo Apana on this, is that in uh, an administrative state and in a state where you have a Westminster style constitution, where you don't have specialized sort of administrative tribunals and uh, courts and, and, and bodies uh, supervising the government, uh, the legislation itself uh, gives a very wide berth to the government in terms of discretion and in terms of the regulations that it may actually promulgate. 
Now, not only has the government uh, restricted movement on the uh, people in Singapore, they have also embarked on a very aggressive uh, mode of contact tracing. And this, this uh, uh, has an impact on uh, private data. So, for example, the government rolled out a, uh, an app, a, a mobile phone app uh, called Trace Together. Uh, I just checked the uh, statistics. Apparently, it's been downloaded by at least 1.8 million people. So we don't know uh, how many people are actually using this. But what it does is that it puts an app in the mobile phone. Uh, of course, it doesn't work if you don't carry your mobile phone. You put it in and you just dump it on your desk, then nothing happens. But it basically uses Bluetooth technology such that when you meet with other people, the other phones would kind of use Bluetooth technology to talk to each other. So if you ever uh, get a, uh, you're infected by COVID-19, uh, the government can ask if you would like to download the data in your phone up into the server so that it can help trace who people uh, were in contact with you, who the people were, and maybe sort of as a preventive measure to have them screened as well. Now, of course, um, if we are doing this on the basis of trying to contain the disease, uh, of course, uh, I think many people are quite happy to do so. I mean, otherwise, why would 1.8 million people uh, download the phone, uh, the, the app? And then we're not counting people who don't use mobile phones or people who are not internet savvy or very young people who don't have mobile phones. Um, and that's because there's a high level of trust that this data is not going to be abused. Uh, and uh, I think one of the things that uh, people have been urging uh, the government to do in, in respect of this is that uh, if they could somehow program in to uh, the, the app, also a run out date, a sunset clause, just like the legislation. Uh, so that, you know, once this, this whole pandemic is over, then maybe you can stop tracking people and, and uh, start taking their data. Finally, uh, in respect of executive power, I cannot uh, miss this. The government has, in addition to uh, controlling movements and so on, rolled out four economic packages in a space of three months, four economic uh, packages, uh, which are rather large uh, and which re uh, requires the drawdown on the national past reserves. Now in Singapore, we have uh, the elected presidency. The elected president actually doesn't have a very big role, largely ceremonial, except where uh, it comes to things like the drawdown on national reserves. This was instituted uh, in, in, in 1991 uh, for fear that in a parliamentary system, it's all too easy for a government to pass budgets that would simply draw down the reserves, you know, wipe the country out and bankrupt the country by giving freebies around. So you needed some kind of a check. And uh, President Halima Yoko, uh, the current president, has actually uh, given in principle uh, agreement to draw down on 52 billion Singapore dollars of reserves, which is about 30 billion US uh, in reserves. Probably not a very big budget con if you compare to, say, Abe's uh, almost one trillion package for Japan. But again, Singapore is a very, very small country. So this is considered a major, major drawdown. The last time we had a drawdown was uh, in 2009 when we uh, were suffering the reeling from the Asian uh, the financial crisis and there was a $4.9 billion drawdown on the reserves. Um, and this was approved by the former president as our northern. Uh, the interesting thing, of course, was that uh, the drawdown was in 2009, but uh, somehow we managed to have sufficient surplus that we replaced that drawdown of, uh, uh, or at least to the tune of $4 billion two years later. So in other words, you, you keep topping up the kitty. So uh, to round up what I'm, 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 I'm uh, saying, I think uh, uh, one thing which Singapore has done a little bit differently from some countries and, and, and like in India is that uh, number one, rather than make use of existing laws uh, and then sort of trying to expand their scope or to create more and more subsidiary legislation, we've actually bothered to pass a particular legislation. And also the constitution was amended to allow for parliament to sit at different places. In other words, the idea is that parliament should not be suspended. It would not be an emergency situation whereby the executive rule by fiat, they do expect to go back to parliament to ask for permissions for whether it's to be drawdown on reserves or passing new laws. 
and so parliament is intended to continue in operation. So that's that's one point. Uh, and they've chosen not to use the emergency route. So this, this pattern is actually quite a gratifying one, especially where you start looking at putting in sunset clauses uh, for some of this legislation. So uh, I think my time is up. Let me stop here uh, and pass uh, the floor over, uh, the screen over to Jin Rong. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Kevin, and thank you for this Asian uh, Law Center to put together this uh, great uh, video conference that allow us in the region, uh, all the constitutionalists uh, in this region to talk about to each other. And, and I think, Kevin, you understand what I'm saying. We have worked very hard to that the constitutionalists, the scholars in the region begin to talk to each other and share experiences and also reflect on the contemporary issues they are facing today. And now this pandemic is of course one of the biggest that we ever confronted before. Uh, I thank you, uh, thanks Melissa and uh, Apana and uh, Kevin. You have covered most of the Asian territory for me and I don't need to elaborate too much about that. But we need to, we need to provide uh, uh, all stories, all the context that are apparent in uh, in this in in Asia, in order to have a uh, have a broader picture. Uh, I, I'm I'm going to uh, sort of talk about three issues, uh, actually three parts. Number one, I will begin to present a theoretical debate about the role of uh, executive in a time of crisis. Uh, this is number one. Number two, uh, in order to respond to that debate, uh, I will provide uh, Taiwan's experience and to sort of, and also my previous experience in the government to sort of enrich the debate and may come up with some other dimensions that we constitutional lawyers always focus on. And lastly, I will wrap up and try to uh, predict for the future, uh, although I'm not that powerful to look into my crystal ball, but uh, based on what we have observed today, uh, we, need, we need to see uh, whether there will be changes in uh, the, the, the uh, governing principles and also operation uh, of the government uh, in the future. Let me begin by uh, presenting uh, constitutional debate nowadays as we see some of the journal articles and some of the comment, online comments that are prevailing uh, in the time of this pandemic. Uh, there's one camp of thought uh, arguing that uh, the executive is such a powerful you know, mechanism that it control almost everything and the majority of resources power, you know, staff, you know, budget, everything. And we need the executive to do the job well. And, and also, uh, because we are in a time of crisis, it's about life saving. Uh, so we should dedicate more power to the executive, uh, better or more than what we did in a normal time. So, executive should stand in the center uh, of the uh, government and also societal uh, apparatus and to deal with the issue. And the theory may go even beyond that by saying that because of this uh, coronavirus epidemic, uh, uh, pandemic, as we see today, uh, we may see this emergency power and expanded power of the executive as a paradigm or model for the future. And the significance of this argument is that after this pandemic, the governing principle, constitutionalism uh, about executive would slide over to the expansion and to the, you know, uh, of the of the executive, and this is one. That's different 
camp would argue otherwise, arguing that even in a time of crisis or emergency that we know very well in the past, that it's about war, about natural disaster, about financial crisis, about that, the government still need to be put in control under the doctrine of separation of powers and limited government. No matter what happened, there should be, you know, check and balance in place to check, to check the operation uh, of, the, of the executive. Uh, if there is going to be some sort of broader dedication of power, unless you also be checked. And the implication of this argument is the distrust of the executive uh, as it is so powerful uh, and so strong. So uh, human rights um, and equality and other values are constantly under threat. So uh, after the significance of this, uh, uh, of this argument, after the, uh, the pandemic will be everything should go back to normal. Nothing left. You know, this is the limit, the, the uh, executive power is for a limited period of time in certain, you know, circumstances. So it's just temporary. So um, everything should go back to normal and, and we should be very vigilant about this kind of transition. Okay, these are two uh, competing and uh, a sort of Sort, sort of views about executive power in time of crisis, uh, particularly in this uh, coronavirus pandemic. What is my view? Uh, based on my uh, ongoing uh, research in uh, constitutional theory, and also as, as Kevin so carefully point out uh, that uh, uh, I had some experience in the government before and and to be more precise in, in, in the executive, uh, serving some major uh, uh, ministries that dealt with emergency, disaster relief, and something similar to what we are doing today. Uh, so what is my view about this? I'm going to say, I'm going to say from the, from the outright that, uh, emergency power or everything granted to the governments, the executive during the pandemic should never be become the paradigm for the future. This is for sure. Separation of powers, limited government concept and check and balance and, and this, this kind of mechanism should be there. And in my opinion, should be should be impressed even in time of crisis right now. I'm going to demonstrate how broad delegation of power to the executive can be in tandem with check and balance, with restraint of the power, with, with check and balance from constitutional perspective, and probably more importantly, from social perspective we may not be able to rely on constitutional court or court to issue, you know, restrict orders, you know, to, to issue something, you know, or injunction timely during the pandemic. But the society is still alive. If this society is an engaged society, it's kind of a vigilant civil society, even in time of crisis, people feel that fear and also needed uh, to, uh, to cooperate with the government in many ways, citizens still exercise some sort of vigilance and exercise that kind of, uh, you know, watch. And, and let, me present, let me present Taiwan's case after when I, when I say this. Uh, the general idea is to say it's not a matter about the power or the scope of delegation of power. It's about how, what's your capacity from the government perspective, from executive perspective, and also from society perspective to deal with the issue in a democratic constitutional way. And it takes dedicated 
is that take dedicated government measures and social awareness or social networking to make things right. Uh, I would like to say Taiwan has demonstrated a model as I observed in recent months. Then based on its sort of ongoing democratic constitutionalism, engaged civil society, and also, and also a uh, sort of new way, new way of governance coming out uh, in recent years. And I think, I think Taiwan's model could present something of significance to the theoretical debate that we just talked about. Um, Taiwan is a sort of natural disaster prone island. We are facing earthquake, uh, typhoon, all kinds of problem every day, not to mention China is, you know, in our neighbor, you know. So we, we need to be prepared for this. Prepare in the sense that we need to provide constitutional basis for emergency power. We also need to come up with some legal basis for the exercise of emergency power in time of crisis. So I, I, I need to say that for uh, this pandemic, uh, as we see the operation, there is a, a central command center uh, holding daily conference every day, every, every day at two o'clock, people would say, well, it's about two o'clock. We need to see, we need to see the conference. People kind of like to see the conference and they have strong expectation to see how Minister Chen, Minister Chen Shizhong, he's the most respected person right now. His approval rate is better than the president. There's no secret that he is now in charge or well, it's probably to say in charge not of the country, but in charge of the society. People rely on him because he demonstrate how the executive should respond to a crisis like this on a responsible, responsive way, and particular based on the you know, modern technology and combined with legal mandate and come up with a model that gradually win people's trust. Trust to fight against the fear. And gradually with that positive circle, people begin to trust that the government and the government is in the way, government release its power, release its capacity, you know, so they at ease doing, making decisions, doing, you know, uh, things, that otherwise would be very, very uh, skeptical to the civil society. So with that kind of positive, good, you know, circle, now the government's approval rate has reached to the peak during this pandemic. Now the president's approval is more than 60, even to 70. And the the ruling party's approval is also, you know, improved dramatically. It's very, very exceptional in, you know, in the world. Not to, uh, not to mention that some of the measures taken are so effective that we use maybe re uh, less restrictive measures to control the spread of the disease. So there is no apparent community spread now, right now. So the government never exercised an, any lockdown, no comprehensive uh, testing, no curfew. Uh, as I just mentioned, uh, over the last three months, I go to stream every morning, continue my exercise. My class has never been closed. There has been no close of the school. Close school still continue, all level of the school, from K-12 to higher education, only there are some sort of class put into online. Um, but now, now things get back and everything looks like 
the government is very, very effective and responsive to the issue and try so hard, try so hard to put things under control and also very transparent, you know, tell everything, everybody about everything. And also, I would like to say, respect privacy and also care about discrimination, equality. And let me just mention something, not only about the compensation, when people put into quarantine or isolation for public goods, there will be compensation provided. And not only that, there is one interesting case that has lots of to do with Southeast Asia, because we have so many migrant workers working in Taiwan. And for some reason, uh, lots of uh, workers, uh, they don't want to go back home and they continue to stay in Taiwan illegally after the term of the work. So the total number will be like more than 50,000 and they are everywhere, including some of them are working in uh, for healthcare, for the elderly and, and in many, many places. So there were confirmed cases about migrant, uh, migrant workers one time and people become very, very concerned about this group of people. You know what government response by the uh, Central Command Center? They call us, they call us to, to recognize the contribution of these migrant, migrant workers, not put them as someone to be cracked down. There was, there was one saying, uh, are they, happen only very briefly, they wish you take this opportunity to crack down these illegal immigrants. But the government didn't do that. On the contrary, they began to recognize their contribution and help them deal with the crisis and the problems, particularly in this hard time. They may, may, they, they may lost their job, you know, and, but they need to be taken care of. Other soft measures, and also control, including very clear legal, legal delegation. So of course we have, uh, on the basis of that, we have uh, a Disaster Relief Control Act, which deal, which deal with typhoon, which deal with earthquake, which deal with all kinds of so-called emergencies, including uh, radioactive accident, including chemical uh, 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 exposure, and of course, including contagious disease like this. So there are legal basis about delegation, about control. It has already be, already be there. Administratively, this kind of con command and control center uh, uh, idea has been in place in Taiwan. I myself, when I was uh, Minister of the Interior, for any typhoon, I had to be the commander in chief sitting in the situation room, overseeing everything and report to the general public and dialogue with the general public about the progress, about the problem, about the resources or location, you know, in the whole, for the whole island. So that's the idea. So for this one, if people are satisfied with this kind of idea, the government have coordinated effort and deal with that kind of dialogue in a very responsible way. There were foundations in the past and for the whole issue. For this particular one, the government also come up with a special law, Convict 19 Special Act, with, with as Kevin say, Sunset Cross. They authorized the power until the end of, of June. So you'll be inspired until the end of June. And also the government need to report to the Congress in three months about the progress and how they, how they use the power or how they use the money and for what purpose and how about the status. Right now, right now, the confirmed cases are only 441 with seven deaths. But the problem is not that statistic. It's about how people fear, how people trust the government and how people relieve their fear during this time of crisis. And I would say the 
executive, the government is doing a good job. But not only that, I would say the whole society, civil society, our human rights groups still watch and still criticize the government. And the government would have to come up and, and explain whether this is constitutional or the, is it still in accordance with the, with the law. So there are check and balance still going on. No court decision right now, but civil groups still very active, very engaged, and still making a lot of noise. But they know, they know they need to have a dialogue with the government and government needs to re respond. And to some extent, government also get the input from the civil society and correct some measures, you know, correct some measures and, and, and take the advice of that. So I see, I see a government taking advantage of ICT information technology. For example, combining what Kevin was saying, combine immigration data and also I see our health insurance uh, card this information then combine together so they will be able to check on the border about the travel history. People may consider- I, I have to ask you to, to, to quickly wrap up, please, because we well, have to I'm move about, the I'm about to read up, uh, even for this uh, technological innovation, and people are very, very happy to see the efficiency of that. Human rights groups still, still check and still ask whether this is constitutional. And government needs to reply and the society needs to digest this. All in all, let me read up. Back to the first thesis that is, whether the executives should have a power in time of crisis, in time of emergency. Yes, but whether they should be checked. Yes, after the crisis, whether this paradigm should continue because the experience in pandemic. No, I, I echo Kevin's, Kevin's idea uh, in the very end of your presentation. That some of the installation, some of the idea, even innovative idea after the pandemic, we need to re-examine and need, the society need to have a, a wellness to, to monitor and to see whether, whether these measures, how to deal with in the application in the future. And I think this is the, this is the function of the uh, constitution and particularly liberal constitutionalism in a way. So Taiwan has been doing well, not because of the law, but because of the total legal framework for the democratic governance that put together government, executive, civil society, and also expertise, medical expertise in the right place. And I think this is something go beyond the, the simple debate about that dichotomy, you know, emergency constitutional power or simply back to normal constitution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jin Rong. Uh, I'm afraid there's too much to say. And so we, we tend to keep going. Uh, there's a lot of questions that have come in. And maybe just to start us off, because I have uh, a number of questions very specifically uh, uh, targeted at Apana, uh, and I've given Apana the questions to answer. Uh, there are a couple of things uh, that have been directed at you. One of them is whether the invocation of the Epidemic Diseases Act is a legally sound one. Uh, the second question here is, as a result of this state and uh, the centralized and the state relationship, do you see more centralization in future because of the invocation of these particular pieces of legislation. And finally, in terms of the uh, stimulus packages, uh, where uh, I think legislatures uh, require some kind of ratification, do you think you are likely to get ex post facto ratification of those expenditures? So maybe uh, you can start us off and then I will move on to the generalized questions. Great. So let me answer the first two questions together. Uh, I think you meant, uh, this is to the, the person who posed the question, I think you meant whether the Disaster Management Act 
uh, ah. is appropriately applied, not the Epidemic Diseases Act, because the Epidemic Diseases Act actually places the bulk of the power with the states and the Constitution places the health subject with the with the state. There is a question, and I think it's a fair question, of whether the Disaster Management Act should be applied in the way that it is being applied by the central government. Now, just to say that the Constitution does give the center the power to deal with interstate spread of infectious diseases. And I think that is where we have a good model for the coordination between the center and the state. The, the state should be looking at state, the internal state matters, and the center should be focusing on interstate issues. Um, this is sort of the model that we have currently in lockdown, what is being called the uh, lockdown 4.0. Um, but lockdown 1.0 to 3.0 were very much center driven. Uh, and that brings me to the question on uh, centralization. The, most of what I was talking about, about the executive usurpation, uh, you know, usurpation of power um, and uh, ceding of power by the, by the legislature, by the judiciary, as well as centralization, actually predate uh, COVID. This is a process that has been happening, and that is why it's so quickly the uh, executive was able to mobilize all the power uh, that it had accumulated over the years and deploy it in the way that it has deployed it. So I do fear that uh, with uh, this, if, if COVID were to become a new normal for uh, the foreseeable future, that we will see a centralization of power using COVID um, as an excuse. On the stimulus uh, issue, it's not so much a con an issue in India only because we have a single party majority currently. So the government's not going to face any problems in getting the uh, stimulus package passed. But I do think it's a very, very important check on executive power, the financial, the, the, uh, the, the requirement for legislative sanction for, um, for executive spending. And that is, uh, that is a safeguard that we should protect very uh, very jealously. So I would be on the side of those uh, who say that if a stimulus package does not pass uh, legislative sanction, then um, then there should be consequences for the government. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to try and roll this uh, number of questions into this one, which actually pertains to the question of uh, accountability and the use of this epidemic, uh, this pandemic as a kind of excuse. So one question which was posed is whether... Uh, you know, how can, how have governments uh, chosen to use this public health ground as a ground for an expansion of their legislative or their executive powers? And in that respect, you know, what, how can they use it as an excuse? So for example, Andrew Harding is asking the question, uh, you know, while in the case of Singapore and Taiwan, they've actually tried to hold legislative uh, uh, meetings in alternative places, or at least in Singapore. Uh, uh, what about other countries where they're using this pandemic to just keep postponing uh, legislative uh, 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 meetings? So it, again, it's a question of transparency and of using this as a kind of excuse. Darius Lee has asked, I mean, WHO has actually said COVID-19 may never go away. So if it never goes away, then is this the new normal? And if this is the new normal, then... Um, how can the constitutional uh, regimes around uh, Asia uh, take into that into account to constrain uh, the expansion of executive power? Uh, this is a uh, question that's open to, to anyone. So maybe I'll just direct it at Melissa and Jin Rong since Apana has already sort of answered three questions. So I'll give her a break. Anyone? Uh, maybe, maybe I, uh, I, I noticed that uh, uh, our friend Andrew Harding, you just mentioned about it, that parliament or Congress issues. In some country, maybe may, uh, people may uh, uh, use, use this pandemic as a, as, as a, a playground or, or, or as, a, as a platform or as an excuse to stop the function of the parliament. And I, I would, I would like to say it's, it's a serious issue, you know, even in a time of crisis, um, because of, of, of any reason that we have to uh, have some sort of social distancing or have to have some sort of lockdown, we, we should try very hard to make sure that our major government functions are still operational, uh, particularly the parliament, the Congress. You know, there are many ways to gather, many ways to make decisions. Uh, as our society has still was, has come up with so, lots of innovative way to have a conference like this one. For, for Congress, 
we particularly during this uh, you know, pandemic, uh, to close down uh, uh, Congress completely, uh, making it an operational uh, for any reason should be stopped. And, and we should try very hard to keep it operation and try to make all kinds of measures to steal that our very important branch of the government uh, is, is still there. Uh, for example, in Taiwan, uh, of course, uh, the, the level of the, of the issue uh, is different, but uh, in Taiwan, our, our Congress stay active and stay open. They continue to review budget and they do just business as usual. Uh, of course, they exercise, and they cooperate with the government. Uh, although they are the the uh, the, uh, the legislature, they also follow the executive by exercising their social distancing. But other than that, other than that, they have been functioning uh, well, and and I have found a uh, less divided uh, legislature uh, in recent month than what it was before, and they began to have thought of you know debate about about the issue and still. Uh, interrogation uh, against the government officials still going on. So yes, uh, uh, Andrew, uh, Dave, uh, 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 Andrew, you just mentioned a very important issue, and this is my my opinion about that. Thank you, Melissa. Do you have anything to to add to this? Um, uh, yeah, just briefly. Um, I mean, some of the questions I think got got me thinking about um, an idea I've tried to develop prior to COVID nineteen, which was of the everyday emergency. So in um, thinking about how emergency powers are used in um, some parts of the region, and I'm particularly thinking of places like Myanmar with Section 144 orders and the similarities in other parts of South Asia with Section 144 orders. Um, the way I've described these in the past is um, that in many ways, a Section 144 order, which is sort of part of the criminal law, has become a kind of de facto emergency power as it, and is in some sense more powerful than a constitutional emergency. So, for example, at the moment in Myanmar, there is no constitutional state of emergency, but there is this use of Section 144 powers. And what this idea of an everyday emergency does is facilitate the role of particularly the police, but also um, potentially um, the military and the administration that are connected to the military um, uh, into broader parts of everyday life. Um, and I've, I've written about this also in the context of Indonesia, although they don't have a common law background, obviously. Um, there's certainly been numerous attempts uh, in Indonesia since 1998 to ensure that the military retains a role in certain aspects of governance. And actually, even in relation to sort of parliament and Andrew's question, um, I think the worrying thing in Indonesia is actually that they have been um, the parliament has been trying to perhaps be too active and has been trying to pass certain laws um, under the cover of COVID-19 um, as a way of getting things through quickly that were otherwise quite controversial and that would further um, limit rights in a range of ways. So I guess there's two ways of thinking about whether you want parliament to be meeting at this moment or not. <laughs> I've just thought of a, a really nice little article, a, a title for an article, covertly through COVID-19. I think <laughs> you, could, you could probably expand on that, whether it's executive or legislative power. Um, but let, let me now throw open the other question, uh, still relating to transparency. Uh, this, come, this question comes from our friend P.Y. Lo in Hong Kong about um, the fact that many governments are actually taking the advice of experts uh, on many of the measures that are being adopted. And his question really is, well, okay, uh, you know, uh, who, who guards the guardians? Who actually, uh, res uh, 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 to whom are these experts accountable to? And, and, and of course, you already see this, I mean, uh, in, in a way quite publicly uh, in, in the United States, for example, where you've got a number of experts arguing both ways about, you know, uh, 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 herd immunity on the one hand and sort of the more uh, 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 sort of epidemic containment type of policy on the other hand. So who, who do you think they should be accountable to and how can we hold them accountable? A a anyone, um, this is open to anybody. Can I, can I come in? On sure, that? Apana, yes. Yeah, let me actually uh, roll that into uh, the previous question as well. I think there's a way of thinking about accountability 
as if it's a zero sum game right either there's accountability or there's no accountability either we hold either the executive's powers are limited or the executive has a free hand and of course we know from administrative law that that's not the case we have a sophisticated range of administrative law tools that can be calibrated up and down proportionality for example can be calibrated up or down to meet the exigencies of the situation depending on what the you know requirement of the situation is so i would just say that accountability in that sense is um, the government might want to say that if you put restrictions on me i will not be able to do anything and that's not really true so that links me uh, brings me to the question of expertise um there is a tendency this that's really been the experience in india as well of going of understanding the response to covid as a technocratic response rather than mm. a political response politics should be out of it and we are bearing the brunt of it the humanitarian crisis that is unfolding in india is principally because we haven't thought of the politics of um, uh, of the lockdown we've thought of it as a medical emergency only and not as a social emergency so um the, the but the but the response to that has to be that uh, the the experts to the extent that they are there um should be accountable to the executive and the executive has to be accountable to the other branches of government because the, the ex- experts don't have decision making power on their own they they are de- ceded that power by the executive which is itself exercising power that has been ceded to it by others so if you can hold the executive to account i don't think uh, we need to worry as much about experts but even if we do there are again so fairly sophisticated administrative law tools already available to bring in experts outside experts uh, into the realm of public uh, scrutiny through public notice and comment procedures through you know open decision making procedures so on and so forth i think we need to think about it not from a necessarily just from a constitutional law lens but also from an administrative like a common law administrative law lens um, to see what principles might apply here well, right in, in i was just uh, a prana was saying let me add some uh, some on, on this issue and i and I, i think that when you talk about executive actually there are a lot of lot of sectors in it one very important is the expertise expertise in the government they are the they are the experts on this on health issue so they know how to deal with the scientific issue like that and there are political you know uh, appointee and they they cooperate so for the dialogue between government and the public like what's going on in taiwan is that the minister will be accompanied by the chief scientist or medical you know experts and they answer to the question scientific question in the press conference every day there will be very interesting scientific question addressed to the government and the government answer in that platform it's not going to be that a professor b professor and answer something like that and also when they answer they answer in a very accountable way if they make mistake they correct the next day and this is a way to co- to coordinate with the uh, with, with with the general public and i think uh, issues like that is is could could happen and particularly in the time of other kind of crisis like for example typhoon earthquake other expertise will come out and say lots of of the Uh, of saying that maybe may put a lots of fear to the general public so government need to deal with this kind of 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 issue like that okay well thank you very much all of you for your responses and i want to also thank our participating audience over 80 persons have joined us and uh Uh, for your questions unfortunately uh, time is at an end and i do need to bring this to a close so let me first of all uh, thank uh, all of you for joining us and especially to thank my dear friends and speakers um apana melissa jinrong uh, for agreeing to take part uh, in this with me so uh, with that um i'd like to say thank you very much and uh, do stay tuned for our next um a uh, virtual round table which is um scheduled for yes here we are right um local central central local relations in asia coming together coming apart and we've got again a very distinguished panel of speakers uh who will uh try to address this question so with that once again thank you all of you and i look forward to seeing you again <laughs>